at the beginning of time, the universe was perfectly uniform. But as, um, as time went on, the universe expands, cools down, and then what happens is uh, gravitation takes over and the matters in the universe start to form clumps because of the, uh, because of the gravitational force. And um, it turns out that most of the matter in this universe cannot be seen by light. Um, uh, anything that has to do with normal person's ordinary life has everything to do with light. Um, you can't see anything uh, if you don't have light. But it turns out that most of the matter in this universe do not interact with light, therefore you don't see it. However, light does interact with gravity, and the matter that we can't see, the dark matter, it's called, um, has gravitational potentials. It has, it, it basically has the power to bend light around itself if there is enough concentration of the dark matter. And we use weak gravitational lensing to see this effect. Now, I mentioned that most of the matters in the universe starts clumping after a while. And it's these clumps that we're after. And you think that, oh yes, the clumps in the universe, those must be galaxies out there. But it turns out that galaxies, the brightest part of the clump uh, that you could actually see is only a tiny spot in the middle of a more bulbous, a dark matter clump that no one can really see except for this gravitational effect. And um, what I do is to try to see this distortion in image, images that uh, the dark matter clumps causes um, to see uh, the degree of clumping that goes on in the universe. Uh, when you make measurements, there are sources of bias. And um, the biasing could be um, human in nature, meaning that the scientist himself or herself um, wants to see a certain answer, and they would bias their data. <laughs> they would only choose data that suits their um, vision of how this experiment should end up being. Or it could be, um, or more likely, if you're <laughs> more likely if you're a good scientist, the source of your bias is going to be in your either in your equipment or how the experiment or the measurement is run. So you make a measurement and you claim that your data point is here. Um, if you know your experiment well enough, then you put an error bar, the systematics and the uncertainty um, of, of your experiment, so that you claim that your data point is here, but you allow yourself a leeway of an error bar. And um, if you claim that you have a very good experiment, then you can, and you know what the uncertainty in your experiment is, then you could start to um, make the error bar small and claim that you have a precise or an accurate measurement. But you have to be careful in doing so because the cornerstone of science is being able to repeat um, independently the same experiment and obtain the same results. So you could claim that your error bar is this small, but if someone else uh, independently performs the same experiment that you have done and claims to have made a me measurement outside of your error bar, of, of your measurement and the error bar allowance, that, that could mean three things. First, that your measurement was wrong. Or second, that your error bar has been grossly underestimated. Maybe it should have been this big to allow that, this possible measurement. Or your, the, the other independent measurement was somehow um, incorrect. What you want to see in science is to have independent measurements um, repeatedly give the same result, the same data point. And, and then you describe the uncertainty in that measurement um, uh, using the error bar. Um, some people, um, uh, depending on their line of work, they would shut their office and sit there by themselves and they need time to concentrate and think in quiet without any distraction. And um, I have called that being in the bottom of the well. <laughs> um, and it is necessary to have, to be able to concentrate and think um, alone because um, in the mind what you are doing, at least in my case what I'm doing, is you're trying to find an answer to the posed question and 
you simulate in your head, um, use your imagination basically to see what could the possible answers or explanation be. And then you have, you, you actually go through many different um, simulations and most of the times you realize, oh, this won't work. And then you start, a, start again and um, do a, run another set of simulations in your head saying, oh, maybe if you do it this way, it would work. Um, that's where you start. And then sometimes you actually have to go out and calculate coding, like write codes on the computer to see if, if it works the way you think it should. Sometimes those are calculations, sometimes those are simulations. But these things, every, everything, uh, all, all the simulation happens in your head. So you kind of need to be by yourself and not be distracted by the outside world. When you, when you ask one question, to yourself that you try to answer in a graduate student thesis. Um, you answer it, and then it brings up more questions. <laughs> and that's, how, that's just how it works. You think, you, know, you think Newton found out the law of general law of gravity, and you think that's over. But no, you, you more, look more into it, and you eventually find that you know, something's, something doesn't work anymore. And then that's how Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity. <laughs> so, um, and then now, now we are finding, now that we thought we understood you know, Einstein's general theory of relativity, we're finding that there's this new cosmological term that we don't understand. And so now that's the big hot topic with cosmology these days.